Hi guys, it's me Chazar HD and welcome to another episode of the podcast where today we are reviewing the Belgian Grand Prix which of course took place yesterday, a race that was a slow burn but it turned into something pretty exciting towards the end but still there was drama after the race that of course we will get into but uh, results obviously I'll flash up on screen and you'll be noticing someone missing from the top 10 that was originally in the top 10. George Russell, who at the time won the Belgian Grand Prix, later on was disqualified for being one and a half kilos underweight. Pretty bad for that to happen um, and pretty bad for it to be so far underweight from Mercedes, I have to say. But it is most importantly such a shame for George Russell that he was disqualified because what a drive it was from him on a one-stop strategy to be able to win that Grand Prix just about ahead of his teammate in um, you know you know on track. But he was disqualified, meaning Lewis Hamilton takes his 105th Formula One victory. Oscar Piastri finishes in second with Charles Leclerc in third. Fourth is Max Verstappen. Fifth, Lando Norris. Sixth is Carlos Sainz. Seventh, Sergio Perez. Eighth is Fernando Alonso. Ninth is Esteban Ocon. And tenth, Daniel Ricciardo. Um, So yeah, disappointing there for Russell. And let's just start straight away with Mercedes-Benz. And, yeah, George Russell, obviously, disqualified from the race. But let's kind of forget about that and more so focus on praising the drive from Russell. Because, I mean, you know, being one and a half kilos underweight by the end of the Grand Prix, I don't think would have gained him that much time. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, if you're underweight, you have to be disqualified. That's what the rule says. But... It doesn't take away anything, as far as I'm concerned, the drive from Russell. And for Russell, he wasn't looking that great, really, up until um, everyone else pitted. Um, You know, in the first stint of the race, he was uh, just ahead of Carlos Sainz in, I think, fifth place. Had a good start to the race, did Russell. Tried to pass Piastri on the first lap, but wasn't able to do so. And then he was kind of stuck in traffic. Um, And after the first round of pit stops, he was racing the Red Bulls, got past Sergio Perez, and then was just kind of idling along, doing some decent pace, but nothing special. But then once, you know, Hamilton, his teammate, and Leclerc, and then eventually Piastri came in, really started to set some really strong lap times on tyres that were obviously quite a bit older than the cars around him. And then when Lewis Hamilton, his teammate, got up to the back of him, really produced, um, I think, was it like three or four laps of just absolute brilliance, doing personal best lap times. Really, really, I have to say in that first sector especially, driving just perfectly, getting a brilliant exit from turn one to protect himself going into, uh, you know, the Camel Straight and Lacombe. It was just perfect driving from Russell. And he still is, without a doubt, the driver of the day for the Belgian Grand Prix, despite the disqualification. Uh, But yeah, brilliant drive from Russell. And I hope he doesn't let this um, disappoint him too much because he has performed very well this season. And that drive right there was arguably... One of the best you know, performances he's ever put in in Formula 1. So yeah, brilliant performance by him. Lewis Hamilton though takes the race win because of his teammates' disqualification. Lewis Hamilton also, um, brilliant drive from him. At the start of the race, you know, got past Sergio Perez straight away. Did very well to hold Perez off down the Kemmel straight who was very close to him on that first lap. Thankfully... Also was able to get the slipstream from Charles Leclerc ahead. And then a couple laps later, passed Leclerc down the Camel Strait up to Lacombe and took the lead and really was comfortable after that. Had a you know two to three second lead for a, quite a long time. And 
came out of his final pit stop, still looking comfortable, was catching his teammate quite quickly. The only thing I think with with Lewis in terms of, you know, what happened with his teammate is I think maybe Hamilton was expecting it to be easier to pass his teammate in those last couple laps. Um, I think maybe... You know, I mean, I, th- I think maybe he was expecting Russell's tires to be in, in worse condition, um, and really wasn't able to punish Russell, especially on the exit of turn one, which is really the most important exit of any corner if you're going to do an overtake at the track uh, later on, obviously on the Kemmel Straight. And Lewis just wasn't able to get a good enough exit from the first corner to be able to actually make that overtake. But still, it's a race win. It was a great drive nonetheless from Lewis Hamilton. I know he won the official drive of the day. He wasn't the driver of the day, though. I think definitely it was George Russell. Uh, But yeah, still a brilliant drive nonetheless from Lewis Hamilton. Um, Mercedes, third win in the last four races. They are the team in form in Formula 1. Who would have thought... They would win three of the last four races coming into the summer break. I don't think anyone thought that was going to happen. Obviously, not always uh, those race wins have been on pace, but in Spa, it was. It was on pure performance, the uh, race win at Spa. So congratulations to Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton, who continues to rise points-wise and I think even maybe position-wise in the drivers championship we'll see later on in the stream obviously when i uh, show you know show that up on screen but let's get into mclaren who obviously with oscar piastri finished in second lando norris finished in fifth they you'd have to say were a bit disappointing in the race because we were expecting more from them on Friday, in the dry conditions, they were stunningly quick. They were way quicker than Ferrari and Mercedes, and even looked a tad quicker than Red Bull, who were looking good on Friday also. But in the race, we didn't really see as much of that. But I think the real failure for McLaren came on strategy in the Belgian Grand Prix. With Oscar Piastri... Obviously, what was it, around, I think, lap 29, lap 30, he was ahead of George Russell, who ended up, you know, doing a one-stop strategy. And Piastri was doing personal best lap times. He had done a fastest lap of the race, I think, a couple of laps before he pitted. Was about five and a half, I think, even six seconds clear of George Russell. And I think, in hindsight, given how well Piastri was looking after the tyres and how good the pace was... I don't understand why McLaren didn't try to do a one-stop with Piastri. I think it was absolutely viable. Even though, yeah, when they pitted Piastri, there was a couple seconds delay on the pit stop because he went a bit too deep. And he was still very close to Hamilton and Russell at the end. I think if they had left him out on a one-stopper, I think Oscar Piastri would have won the Grand Prix. I just don't understand why McLaren didn't take that risk because before the second round of pit stops, they weren't really that close to the race leader and I think were in the type of position that, say, Russell was in where that that risk was worth taking. It's not like Piastri was only a couple seconds off the lead and, you know, could still easily win uh, by doing another pit stop. It was a risk worth taking, but I'm just... I'm surprised McLaren didn't at least try to go for the one-stopper. Um, but, you know, they didn't. Piastri, again, had a, a couple seconds slower pit stop than ideally he would have wanted and ended up very close behind Lewis Hamilton at the end, but it wasn't to be in terms of winning the race. But I think he absolutely could have won that race and McLaren could have won that race if... They had decided to go for that gamble, which I think definitely was worth going for. I mean, look at Mercedes. They thought it was worth going for, and it absolutely was with Russell, obviously, until he got disqualified from the race. For Lando Norris, though, I have to say, 
I think his race effort was pretty bad. At the start, driving into the gravel on the exit of turn one, shocking mistake from him. You know, no one was near him. There was no reason to drive into the gravel. He, yeah, just forced himself off the track, uh, basically. And that really hurt him at the start. Because if he had not done that, he probably would have finished on the podium um, if it had not been for that, given the pace of the McLaren, especially later on in the race. But, like I said, cost himself dearly. And then after that, he never really did anything um, in terms of like his fight against Max Verstappen. Obviously, Lando went longer into the race than the first stint. Max was able to undercut his way past. And then whenever Lando got up to the back of Max, never put up a fight against Max, was never able to get close enough. And I don't know if it was just, again, not able to get a good enough exit from turn one or, you know there was some like mental something going on with Lando in terms of you know trying to catch and pass Max um, but I, I just thought it was a really poor race effort from Lando given that he had had a decent weekend up until that point you know in practice in the dry looked very quick qualifying wasn't the greatest but he was still fourth on the grid ahead of his teammate and then in the race he performed pretty much like a number two driver would for McLaren if McLaren had a number two driver to, um, you know, to Oscar Piastri. It was just a very poor effort for someone who we know is much better than that. And given the pace of the McLaren in that race, Lando should have beaten Verstappen and probably beaten Leclerc as well and finished at least in what well, what would have been with Russell's disqualification, third place. But he didn't take the opportunity, and that's why Lando Norris is not going to win the Drivers' Championship, because when the opportunities present themselves, he doesn't take them. And that's what you have to do when, you know, you're in a championship battle. When the opportunity to grab a few extra points um, is there and take points away from your rival, you've got to take it. And he, in the last few races has continuously failed to you know maximize the pain for Max Verstappen and that's why the championship is the way it is um we'll quickly touch on Ferrari who had a I'd say overall in the end I'd say a good race given the result um I think a podium is what Ferrari were hoping for I think they know they didn't have the pace to win the Grand Prix Leclerc, though, I thought put in a brilliant drive to be, um, you know, up in second and up in the top three, four on the, uh, you know, in the field uh, for so long. Because especially in that final stint, for uh, the Ferrari car was really starting to struggle. So I think Leclerc put in a fantastic drive in the race. Um, and he can be very proud of the performance in general he put in over the weekend. Carlos Sainz, though, I am very much disappointed with um, not his performance, but strategically from Ferrari, I am disappointed with how they managed his race because he started on the hard tyre, went really nicely long into the race, I think, was it 20 laps, went onto the medium compound tyre and then... I mean, he only did, I think, what, seven laps. And it was kind of like a waste of a stint. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it kind of you know, ruined his race. And, I mean, I know he wasn't going to do a one-stop strategy after that first stint because, you know, the medium was not going to do 22 laps. But it, I think that middle stint is what cost him potentially maybe finishing on the podium. Uh, because it was just so short and meaningless, really. And uh, it, it was really, for Ferrari, it, it's almost like they knew their pace on the medium compound was so bad, um, and their tyre wear maybe was you know so bad, that they were just trying to get that tyre out of the way so they could get onto the hard uh, compound tyre, which, I mean, is slightly understandable, but... They, again, just didn't go long enough on that medium, I think, to maybe maximise what they then did on the hard compound tyre. So, yeah. Um, Carlos Sainz's race could have been better, I feel, uh, strategically. But 
But that's the way it ended up, unfortunately, for him. Still a good amount of points, though, for Ferrari. 23 points. Uh, more than Red Bull. And not only are McLaren catching Red Bull, but Ferrari are as well. So watch out for Ferrari. They're not out of the championship fight in the Constructors Championship. Um, and the out of the uh, front teams, of course, finally we will go on to Red Bull Racing. Um, yeah, what a, a poor race for them. For Sergio Perez, he his first stint was all right. But once they, and I think this was probably more so Red Bull's uh, fault uh, to an extent, uh, because Red Bull only had one set of the hard compound tyre for Perez. Um, he then obviously had to go on to a set of mediums for that uh, second stint. And those tyres really started to fall away in the second stint. And I think that's really what cost him for the rest of the race, having to pit earlier and then obviously once everyone else pitted, he really dropped off the pace. Uh, did get the fastest lap point. But yeah, Sergio ending up in, what was it, 7th place in the end. I think Sergio's done. I think, especially with the, you know, the drive that Daniel Ricciardo put in yesterday. Brilliant drive from Ricciardo to get 10th. And was you know, very uh, competitive in a racing bulls car that wasn't necessarily that quick uh, at Spa last weekend. Um... Yeah, I think put in a really strong performance in the race there. And I think Ricardo will be in that car in Zanvor. And Perez probably won't be in any car for the rest of the season. And we'll see, obviously, how uh, or where possibly he ends up. But I think Perez has had his chance. And um, I don't think is uh, is going to be seen for quite a while, unfortunately, as Sergio Perez. Um, but yeah, other than the top four teams, uh, actually also, uh, one thing I forgot to, uh, get into is obviously Max Verstappen, his race, very uneventful race. Um, I think one thing that cost Max is, uh, Red Bull, I think probably did have a bit too much wing on their car because I think even Perez complained on the radio that the car was, uh, just didn't have enough straight line speed. And I think that, is why Max, it appeared, he was very quick in the middle sector behind another car. Uh, but in the first sector, he just couldn't make up any ground. Because I think they applied a bit too much downforce to the car to get him a good grid position for the grid in the race. Obviously with him qualifying first on Saturday. Um, but Verstappen, yeah, did the best he could. The only thing really he could have done is pass Leclerc before the end. But... If the Red Bull was struggling for straight line speed because it had a bit too much wing on, then I'm not really sure what Max could have done because the Ferrari is pretty fast in a straight line. So, yeah, I think, you know, given the grid penalty and all of that, I think Max, all in all, did the best he could. And plus, beat, um, uh, what do you call it? He beat Lando Norris. In the race, his main championship rival, which is all that matters. And that's obviously all that matters now to Max is winning his fourth world championship. And of course, he is going to do it uh, probably in two or three months from now. But um, another race for Red Bull without a race win. And that uh, 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 after the Belgian Grand Prix, it's now been, I think, what, three of the last four races, uh, Max has not been even on the podium for Red Bull. So Red Bull have got to get their act together in the second half of the season. Dutch Grand Prix is next. You would hope Max would be really on form for that. But will Red Bull be on form for that? We'll have to find out when we get there. But uh, for the midfield runners, I mean, Alonso finished in eighth. Uh, I think he was on a one-stop strategy as well, so I'd say good drive for Fernando. Ocon ended up ninth, Ricardo tenth. Uh, I thought Alex Albon performed well in the Williams, uh, but there wasn't really much else to, to talk about, really, uh, from the midfield. But that is, of course, the Formula 1 season now done until the uh, end of of August but of course uh, there is one final thing for me to get on to 
before we come to the end of this podcast episode. And what it is, is me uh, reading out a uh, question from uh, the Woden that I forgot to read out in my last recording. And it's a question to do with Audi, where he asks, everyone is saying Audi will struggle to start with in 2026, even though we'll have new engines and aero regs. Thoughts? Um... I mean, in terms of, you know, people saying Audi are going to struggle to start in 2026, it's impossible to say because we have absolutely no idea who is going to be where in 2026 because it is such a massive um, change, you know, the regulations for, um, you know, the um, the next era of Formula One. We have had, though, regarding Audi, some news. Obviously, Mattia or Mattia Bonotto has been signed up by Audi to be their, I think, chief technical officer. And looks like, at the moment, is going to be basically the guy running the team. But there are rumours that Audi, because Andres Seidel they've let go... There are rumours that they are going to be going after the Aston Martin team boss, Mike Crack, possibly to be their team principal, and then Bonotto will be the technical guy. If they do go with that as their, um, I guess, the two major people running the team, I think that's a pretty good, um, you know, uh, know, uh, personnel hiring for Audi because with Bonotto we know when it comes to running a team he just isn't good at it but when it comes to the technical side of Formula One he is absolutely very talented we saw that at Ferrari multiple times yeah he still made some fuck-ups here and there but most of the time his work was good at Ferrari so if he can just stick to the technical stuff and let someone else deal with the, you know, sorting out the drivers and, you know, all the stuff that a team principal does, then it hopefully should work out well. But in terms of who's going to be quick and who isn't in 2026, I don't know why anyone is really talking about that. Because again, we have no idea until we get to 2026. I know there's rumours that Mercedes-Benz um, are, are very confident about their power unit. Um, but again... We don't know whether it will be the best and whether they will be the best team until we get to 2026. So there's no real point fretting over 2026. And with how exciting Formula 1 is at the moment, um, yeah, let's just concentrate really on the rest of this year and especially 2025, which could be one of the most exciting Formula 1 seasons in recent history, given how competitive things are right now but uh thank you guys for coming along to this a uh, bit shorter podcast episode i will be though recording another podcast uh very quickly after this one is released and later this week on friday night i will be uploading another episode of the podcast which will be my mid season review for the 2024 Formula 1 season, when we'll go through all of the stuff of the season so far. Uh, The most uh, fun thing we'll be going through is driver rankings, but we'll go through other things as well, obviously looking at all the teams and how they performed, how they can do better, uh, the best races of the season so far, all of that stuff we'll be covering in that mid-season review. And then, of course, yeah, we uh, in terms of the next uh, Grand Prix, it is uh, about a month away. And then, once we get back from the summer break, there are lots of races coming up in 2024. Still plenty of excitement to be had in 2024. But yeah, thank you guys for coming along to this podcast episode. Until the next one, later this week on Friday night, reviewing the 2024 season so far. It has been me, Chazer HD. Goodbye.